ahead and get started. Uh, committee, are there any bill introductions this morning? Representative Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to introduce a bill, RS-1288, and it would be uh, dealing with the possibility of an additional bonding issue for CAPERS. All right, committee, you've heard the uh, bill introduction. Is there a second? Seconded by Representative Prail. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Any further bill introductions? All right, seeing none. We'll go ahead and move on to the hearing on Senate Bill 16, which be removing the requirement that certain entities submit certain reports to the division of post audit. And so I'll turn it over to David. David, can you give us a brief on Senate Bill 16? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you and good morning. Uh, Senate Bill 16 was introduced by the Legislative Post Audit Committee, and it would eliminate the current requirement that uh, four uh, reports be submitted to the Legislative Post Audit Committee or to the Post Auditor. Uh, the first report that would be eliminated would be actual expenditures report from nonprofit corporations providing legal services for indigent inmates in the can in Kansas Correctional Institutions. Uh, the report still would be submitted to the Director of the Budget, but not to Post Audit. Uh, section two would remove the requirement that reports on accounts receivable and taxes receivable from the Director of Accounts Reports uh, section three would be an annual CPA audit of corporations under contract with and substantially controlled by the Board of Regents or a state educational institution. This report still would be submitted to the Board of Regents. Um, section four would remove the requirement that reports from the Secretary of Revenue of tax abatements that reduce a final tax liability of $5,000 or more. Uh, the report would still be submitted to the Secretary of State and to the Attorney General. Um, if enacted, Senate Bill 16 take effect upon a publication in the statute book, uh, July 1st, uh, 2021. And I can stand for any questions. All right, thank you, David. Uh, committee, are there any questions for David? Representative Wolfmore. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, David. And now that I'm hearing more about it, maybe I, it, it seemed very familiar to a bill we did last year and I thought maybe it got dropped because we ended early. Is that, is this the same bill? Uh, yes, David. Representative. It's uh, it's pretty similar to a bill that was introduced last year and got yeah got caught up in, in the COVID situation. And, and as I recall, I don't I, I don't. You said it's pretty similar, so it's not exactly the same, correct? I mean, well, it is the the same bill. I'd have to look back and see exactly okay. what bill it was. But yes, it's, it's and I don't recall shirt. this committee having any issues with it. But you might not remember that. David? Uh, I, yeah, I don't remember. I, I don't believe so, but I'd have to check to be sure. Okay. I don't think there was a problem. I mean, it, the Senate, the Senate passed, went on the consent calendar from yeah. uh, Senate Ways and Means, and then was passed 37 to 0 by the Senate. So. And we ne ours never made it to the floor, right? I guess uh, it did. I'd have to check. I don't think so. That's, a, but. that's okay. I, I was just refreshing my memory on what this was. Thank you so much. Committee, any further questions for David? All right, seeing none. Thank you, David. Uh, we'll go ahead and move on to the testimony in regards to Senate Bill 16. And the only individual that I have uh, here in person is Justin Stowe with Legislative Post Audit. Justin? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee. Uh, I might just add that that is also my recollection. We had a, a identical bill last year. It made it here from the Senate consent calendar, but was never able to get a hearing because of COVID-19. Those coalesced at the same time. So I would also mention to the committee, just very briefly, because post audit the committee is a joint committee, we introduced duplicate versions of our bills in, in both chambers. And so the identical bill this year is House Bill 2050 that was placed on the consent calendar of the House and has been moved over to the Senate. It's sitting currently with Senate Transparency and Ethics. So just so you all are aware, that bill is over there. They have not yet held a hearing on that version. Um, uh, the revisers did a great job of explaining this. I'll keep my testimony very, very brief. I provided a single front and back uh, page testimony to you electronically. Uh, just a reminder to this committee, the reason that we are requesting that we no longer receive these reports is because we are no longer in the financial audit 
management business. So it, it used to be many years ago, Post Audit was in charge of uh, overseeing the contracts for the state's financial audits. In 2018, at our request, because that's really not a, a core function of our business model, we had that moved to the Department of Administration. We actually gave up one of our FT positions to the department to take that over. These reports are related to that function. So it, it basically, our request is to just streamline government here a little bit. We don't need these reports. It takes time and effort and energy on the part of the, the, the report requirements that, that fall on these agencies. They have to submit it to us and then we file it and don't do anything with it. So we are just asking that we be removed from that. We've checked that with our committee. Um, you know, there, this information does typically go to other oversight bodies. And so we have that on the second table. You'll see a lot of these reports are still going out to other uh, interested committees or oversight bodies with the single exception of the report on taxes written off, the, the write-off report on accounts receivable. In that case, though, we think the report is already with the appropriate persons with the Department of Administration who oversees these audits and will be in close contact with the financial auditors. Um, you know, overdue accounts receivables is typically something they take a look at every year. So we think that that's probably fine. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that's the extent of it. We're just asking for a little bit of streamlining here. We just don't want to create work that is not providing value to our agency or our committee. So happy to answer any questions you may have, sir. All right. Thank you, Justin. Committee, you're in any questions for Justin? All right, seeing none, thank you again for being here. Thank you, sir. I'm not showing any more proponents, opponents, or neutral testimony, so I will close the hearing on Senate Bill 16. The next item on the agenda is the budget recommendations from the Transportation and Public Safety Budget Committee, and so I'll now turn it over to Chairman Francis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And please indicate which budget you're going to be starting with and the volume and page. Yeah, and I think we'll start with the Sensing Commission. It's the easiest, hypothetically, of the two. It's uh, volume one, page 585. I feel a little bit like a, a lamb being led to a slaughter with uh, two hours to go through these two uh, budgets. So. Uh, Okay, so one of the things I wanted to uh, go over at the very beginning, sometimes, you know, we get into these budgets so much we kind of forget what everybody knows and what everybody doesn't know, but the Kansas Sentencing Commission uh, basically has two uh, primary uh, functions. Uh, one is they do uh, research statistical analysis and agency administration. What they do primarily is they... Uh, uh, as far as that research goes, they kind of develop how bills are going to affect our uh, capacity at our uh, at our mental, uh, or excuse me, at our uh, prisons. And I'm trying to find the last capacity sheet that we got. I like the ways you pull these things out so you can find them more easily and then they're not where you thought they were. Um, well, it's probably sitting on my desk somewhere. I thought I'd just share those numbers with you. You know, it's just amazing how much the, the capacity uh, utilization of our prisons has switched because of uh, COVID. So anyway, they do that. They uh, They... They go in and they analyze how uh, bills are going to affect the uh, capacity in our prisons. And then also they administer the uh, SB 123 uh, substance abuse treatment. Um, so mainly they make sure that the pass through of those payments go to the providers. Um, and I think one of the great things about having both of these budgets today is, you know, our committee feels like we need to uh, continue to work on ways to keep people out of prisons instead of figuring out what we're gonna do with them once they get into prison. And this SB 123 program that they administer goes a long way with that. So getting into uh, the fiscal year 2021 budget, 
Uh, the agency requested a revised estimate of 12 million, including 11.9 million from the state general fund in fiscal 2021. When we worked this budget last year, we only gave them about 2 million. The reason it's 12 million instead of 10 million is because they had a reappropriation of an ending balance from last year. And that was caused primarily because of COVID. They were treating less, uh, less uh, people in the SB 123 program um, because of court delays and sentencing and, and things of that nature. So the governor, when she uh, reviewed this uh, budget, she recommended expenditures of 10 million, including 9.8 million SGF in fiscal year 2021. This is an all funds decrease of 2 million or 16.4% um, and an SGF decrease of 2.1 million or 18% below the agency's fiscal year 2021 revised estimate. The recommendation decreases expenditures in an amount equal to SGF monies reappropriated for fiscal year 2020 into fiscal year 2021. Again, like I mentioned earlier, the recommendation includes decreasing payments to treatment providers in the uh, 2003 SB 123 substance abuse treatment program by 1.9 million. Uh, she lapsed uh, 920,000 of it and 986 is shifted to a planned reappropriation into fiscal year 2022. Further, the recommendation does not include 69,000 estimated by the agency for the initial phase in a two-year pay increase plan. They had a payroll study done, and as part of that, they asked for a $69,000 increase in salaries. Um, the recommendation includes 13.8 FTE positions, which is unchanged from the agency's fiscal year 2021 revised estimate. And the Budget Committee concurred with the Governor's recommendation in fiscal year 2021. So I would stand for questions on 2021. All right. Thank you, Chairman Francis. Committee, any questions for Chairman Francis in regards to fiscal year 2021? Seeing none, we move on to 2022. Okay. 2022, the agency requested 10 million, <clears throat> including 9.9 .9 million SGF for fiscal year 2022. This is an all funds decrease of 2 million or 16.5% and an SGF decrease of 2.1 million or 17.3% reappropriation that occurred in fiscal year 2021, not reoccurring for 2022. Again, that's the decrease in uh, uh, treatment programs on, under SB 123 because of uh, COVID. The governor recommended expenditures of 10 million, including 9.8 million SGF for fiscal year 2022. This is an SGF decrease of 82,659 or 0.8% below the agency's fiscal year 2022 request. The recommendation does not include $82,659 budgeted by the agency for the final phase of a two-year pay increase program. The recommendation includes an SGF reduction of 986,490 to reduce the expenditures by 10%. However, the recommendation utilized the uh, 986,490 in the planned re reappropriation from fiscal year 2021 for the SB 123 substance abuse program. Um, this will allow the agency to meet its current anticipated expenditures for the program in fiscal year 2022. And the recommendation includes 13.8 FTE positions, which is unchanged from the fiscal year, from the agency's fiscal year 2022 request. So the budget committee uh, concurred with the governor's recommendation with two adjustments. One, we recommend that we review at Omnibus the addition of the 82,659 all SGF for an agency-wide pay increase as referenced in their third party uh, salary study for fiscal year 2022. And also, we understand that we always do this uh, on a regular basis, but we wanted to uh, bring attention to uh, the possible effects of uh, HB 2026. So we asked for a review at Omnibus, uh, the addition of 250,000 all SGF for the SB 123 substance abuse treatment for uh, expenditures, expenditures associated with HB 2026 which would establish a certified drug abuse treatment program for certain persons on diversion for fiscal year 2022. That was the only bill at the time that we heard it that would affect their future SB 123 expenditures that had passed the House. I think there's some others floating through. And I, again, um, 
certain uh, stakeholders asked us to bring attention to that bill, so that's why we did that. And with that, I'd stand for questions. All right, committee, any questions for Chairman Francis in regards to fiscal year 2022? Not seeing any. Chairman Francis. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move the committee recommendations for the Kansas Sentencing Commission budget for fiscal years 2021 and 2022 be approved. All right, committee, you heard the motion. Is there a second? Seconded by Representative Helgerson. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Chairman Francis. So the next budget ties in a little bit with that one. It's um, the uh, Department of Corrections budget. Again, oh, look at that. I finally found that capacity letter. Uh, <laughs> look through that Would you like to share times. that with the committee now? <laughs> Let me share that with everybody. Out. So when I became chairman of this committee before COVID, we had a capacity problem. I'm telling you, it was like dire. COVID comes through here, and now KDOC capacity is for males is 9,420, and the actual population on January 31st was 7,979. Uh, for females, it was 948 was capacity, and we're currently at 750. Now, that doesn't mean nothing needs to be done as far as addressing some needs in, in uh, the correction system, but... Uh, it, it's, it's a stark change from what it was before uh, COVID. And uh, we did talk to the secretary about it, and he said it makes things a lot easier to manage when uh, you know, we're not busting at the seams. Uh, just a brief overview on, on this. Uh, oh, I never did tell us uh, what page did I? It is uh, volume one, three, four, page 341 for uh, corrections. I, I think there's a question. Uh, in regards to capacity. Uh, Representative Sutton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That drastic reduction in capacity, was that because we released uh, prisoners for fear of COVID or because they were killed by COVID? What, what happened? Where did I they think go? it was primarily because the court system wasn't in, uh, meeting and sending new people into the system. Excellent. All right. That makes sense. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you. All right, Chairman Francis. Yeah, so again, it's volume one, page 341. I don't know if everybody's had a chance to get there yet. Um, so, you know, when we think of Department of Corrections, and we fall victim to this in my uh, committee sometimes, we get so focused previously on the capacity problems and, and riots and, and things of that nature that we forget kind of the broad scope of, of this agency. Um, and I think about this a lot of times when we talk about EROs and combining agencies and making them bigger and bigger. But this agency also uh, includes uh, community-based supervision. You know, a lot of us call that community corrections. Uh, and it also uh, handles our community juvenile-based uh, uh, agencies too. Uh, we call, I used to call them JJA. But so it's more than just, uh, locking uh, people up that have uh, committed crimes. And like uh, the Sentencing Commission, I, I just want to reiterate how important my committee feels like it is to address the underlying causes of criminal behavior. And a lot of those are tied to uh, mental health issues and they're tied to uh, substance abuse issues. Um, and I do want to commend the agency. I think they're trying to take steps to address those underlying issues. Um, before I get into the really interesting parts of this budget, I thought I might highlight a few things. One, uh, they received uh, around $25 million in a, a SPARC task force funds that could be used for uh, salaries. There was an exception in uh, some of the, those federal funds that they could be used for uh, public safety um, over the years, we've had a lot of conversation about the need for uh, uh, or the issues regarding uh, Hep C. Uh, we talked a lot about Hep C in the committee. Uh, Hep C is still costing about fifteen thousand an inmate to treat, so it's a huge budget item. But if you guys go to uh, page, I had to find the right.
you go to uh, page 378, uh, you can see how we've really made big strides in the treatment of uh, Hep C in the in the prison system. You know, they show actual treatments of 44 in 2018, 110 in 2019, 444 in 2020, and then they're estimating about 500 a year in uh, 2021 and 2022. And again, because of the cost of that, it's hard to um, address that a lot faster. Um, and then one of the other things that I want to keep everybody in mind is there's some rehab being done at a Winfield for a geriatrics center and then um, creating some uh, uh, a, a cell for a, a cell block for a substance abuse at uh, Lansing. Um, those things were budgeted last year, but because of COVID and some of the allotments that we did, they got slid back a year. So you're going to see some uh, uh, funding for those. And Merle, tell me if I'm remembering this right. Um, the second year of that is being funded by the uh, state building fund. Is that correct? Okay. I do want to apologize. Uh, when I did KBI the other day, I got a little bit confused about um, there's a um, reduction in force at central office in this one, and I got it confused with the KBI one. Um, but anyway, that, that's one of the things that's that's going on there. Um, a third thing that's really a big deal in here is uh, they've got a uh, unemployment, or they've got a uh, computer software uh, program that was designed in the same era as our uh, unemployment software was. And uh, they're taking the opportunity to uh, upgrade that at this time. So anyway, we'll go get into the real interesting stuff now. Um, in fiscal year uh, 2021, the agency requested a revised estimate of $488.3 million, including $436.6 million from the state general fund for the entire uh, Department of Corrections system. These expenditures are for uh, KDOC, Kansas Correctional Industries, the eight additional correctional adult correctional facilities and the Kansas Juvenile Correctional Complex. Uh, this is an offense decrease of $25.2 million or $4.9 million and an SGF decrease of $32.1 million or 6.8% um, below the fiscal year 2021 approved amount. The revised estimate includes 3,364.5 FT positions for the KDOC system, which is an increase of 22 FT positions above the fiscal year 2021 approved amount. If you'll remember, we were here in, I think, one of the mental hospital um, uh, budgets earlier, and someone had talked about people being in the uh, Larnard uh, juvenile facility. This addresses that. This position increases mainly temporary uh, correctional officer positions at the Larnard Correctional Mental Health Facility, which is the juvenile facility. It, the name doesn't get changed for I don't know what reason, but... Uh, to support a temporary COVID-19 intake isolation unit at the former Larnard Juvenile Correctional Facility. So when we'd heard people were in those beds, that's, that's what was going on there. Um, the agency requests revised operating budgets totaling $470.3 million, including $429.4 million in fiscal year 2021. This is an all-funds decrease of $27.4 million, or 5.5%. And an SGA, SGF decrease of 32.1 million or 7% below the fiscal year 2021 approved amount. The decrease is primarily attributable to decreased expenditures from the evidence based juvenile programs account of 42.2 million. So, in the governor's budget, um, uh, she's requested to uh, basically reallocate those funds out of this. Uh, program. Uh, that's to align with the governor's proposed allotment plan. Such an allotment requires legislative approval pursuant to KSA 75-3722. The decrease is partially offset by increased expenditures for the agency's supplemental request to fully fund the correctional system's medical services contract at $9.4 million, the food service contract of $665,000, 
the agency budgeted ten point six million for co contracted beds at the Saguaro Correctional Facility in Arizona and county jails. So she has uh, lowered some of those um, allocations as those prisoners have came back to uh, the state. Additionally, the agency budgeted $1.5 million off from a federal grant to use the former Lerner Juvenile Correctional Facility as a COVID-19 intake isolation unit for adult male offenders. Uh, the fiscal year 2021 revised estimate includes capital improvement expenditures for the KDOC system of $18 million, including $7.2 million SGF. This is an all funds increase of $2.2 million. Uh, and an SGF decrease of $22,718 from uh, the fiscal year 2021 approved amount. This increase is primarily attributed to increased expenditures on special revenue funds for routine repair or rehab uh, projects at correctional facilities. Uh, the agency budgeted $7.2 million SGF in first year expenditures for the two year capacity expansion projects that include a substance abuse treatment center at the Lansing Correctional Facility that I mentioned earlier and a nursing care and substance abuse treatment center at the Winfield Correctional Facility. So that's their recommendation. Now we'll go into the governor's recommendation. Um, she recommends expenditures of 478.8 million, uh, including 398.1 million from SGF for the entire KDOC system in fiscal year 2021. This is a decrease of 9.5 million or 1.9% and an SGF decrease of 38.4 million. Uh, the recommendation includes a lapse of 42.2 million from the evidence-based juvenile programs account as part of the governor's allotment plan and the decrease is partially attributable to a lapse of other SGF monies reappropriated from fiscal year 2020. Some of those are, again, a decrease of the 9.1 million SGF for uh, contracted beds uh, in Arizona, a decrease of 4 million for inmate food services and health care due to lower population in our facilities, and an increase of 28.2 million from uh, federal coronavirus relief funds uh, they were used uh, for salaries and wages of 25 million, central office 2.6 million, um, PPE for 551,000. Uh, and so this increase is partially offset by a decrease of 25 million in the SGF. The governor recommends 18.8 million, including 7.2 million SGF for capital improvement expenditures throughout the system in fiscal year 2021. This is an increase of 785,000. All of that comes from Federal Cures Act funds, uh, and it's 4.4% above the agency's 2021 revised estimate. Okay, this increase is attributable to an allocation of 785,000 for the from the Federal Coronavirus Relief Fund um, for a COVID-19 quarantine unit at the Winfield Correctional Facility, and the recommendation includes 7.2 million SGF for the first year's expenditures of the two-year capacity projects at Lansing and Winfield. So uh, when we uh, went into this, we had a lot of conversations and we had some testimony about some of the issues uh, at the agency. Uh, our, we concurred with the governor's recommendation with two exceptions. One, we did not approve the 42.2 million uh, uh, laps from uh, evidence-based juvenile programs in the governor's recommendation in fiscal year 2021. We restored that funding and uh, the restored funding would supplement 14.3 million in recommended expenditures from the account for grants and statewide contracts supporting evidence-based community programs for juveniles and their families to decrease reliance upon incarceration. So the way this money wound up in this account was if you remember in, in uh, 2016, we had some juvenile justice reform and we greatly decreased the amount that we were spending on juvenile justice and, and the thought and, and the theory was that people, were, kids were being put in prisons that didn't need to be put in prisons. And the best thing to do was to make sure that they had the programming to help them be successful. So when they set that bill up, they said, 
the money that we're saving from juvenile justice programs, we're going to put in this evidence-based juvenile programs account, and then we're going to use that for programming. Some of the programming has been slow to come out. That's why there's that amount. But there are large funds moving in and out of that account. Um, you can also see over time where the amount of money going into the account is decreasing. Um, and, and that's why it's even more important to try to keep that funding there so it's available for future uh, prevention programs. Um, some of the conversations we've had regarding uh, facilities in the state, we made another recommendation that directed the central office to provide a cost estimate prior to omnibus for a study of repurposing the Kansas Juvenile Correctional Facility and establishing three or more smaller regional juvenile facilities Regions for consideration should include South Central, Northeast, and Western Kansas, with a preference toward utilizing existing state and county facilities rather than new construction. The study should also address future plans for the former Larner Juvenile Correctional Facility and other underutilized facil facilities within the correctional system. Um, Representative Jennings, in his testimony regarding the evidence-based juvenile uh, account and some uses for that, mentioned to us the fact that current best practices for juveniles was to have them located as close to their home as possible. Uh, Representative Resman, by the way, does an excellent job as my vice chair and has huge institutional knowledge of some of these things across the state. As a result of criminal justice or juvenile justice reform, uh, there's facilities in Johnson County and Wichita, for instance, that are being underutilized because, again, we've changed the law, so we've got kids staying uh, in their homes trying to get services to rather than, than being in a, the, the juvenile correctional facilities. So we kind of tweaked what uh, uh, Representative Jennings came up with, and, and we really want them to try to look to see if we can meet that need by using existing capacity in Johnson County and Sedgwick County. Western Kansas may not work out quite that well. Um, and again, it's up to the agency to come back with the cost to make sure that, that we want to proceed with that. So again, this is just a, a request for a cost estimate to do this study. Um, but for a number of reasons, uh, we may not be able to use existing facilities in Western Kansas. Um, anyway, that's what we did for that first year of 2021. And I would stand for questions. All right, thank you, Chairman Francis, and, and thank you for elaborating on um, how the facility at the Larned Correctional Facility was being utilized. Uh, there was a lot of questions, um, obviously, some of those posed by me, myself, uh, when we were talking about the uh, state hospital at Larned and that correctional facility that's on the campus. So thank you for elaborating on that. Uh, the first question that I have is how much are we spending uh, annually on hepatitis C in the correctional facilities? I want to say it's 6.2. Is that right? Six million? Six million. Six million? Okay. Yeah. Um, the next question that I have, and I know that the, the governor has, you know, a, a decrease in her budget, but I'm a little concerned, and maybe you can elaborate on this, with an increase of 28.2 million from federal dollars that was allocated from the Spark Task Force and then approved. I'm assuming by the State Finance Council, because that's the way the process is supposed to work. But we have an increase of salaries and wages of $25 million that was coming from the federal dollars. That will continue if we don't receive any, or we probably will, but if we don't receive any additional federal dollars to offset that increase, it's going to be a state general fund expense, correct? It's my understanding that she basically paid, those would have been, those were originally scheduled to be state general fund expenses, and she just supplanted that state general fund expense with, with, uh, the, the, current, with the federal dollars, right? So it's, in it wasn't fiscal a, year 2022 or 2023, we'll see that reallocation yes. back as a state general fund expense. Okay, yep. thank you. Yeah. And then I think you you kind of explained um, the addition from the budget committee in regards to the forty two point two million dollars for the evidence based juvenile program. So I don't have any further questions in regards to that. Uh, Representative Hoffman. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And yeah, I just wanted to reiterate that it's very important, I think, that we protect that 42.2 million. Um, eventually, hopefully, we get these programs going and, and we'll be able to use that money. Also, um, I appreciate the uh, number two, and I, I serve on that on that oversight committee, and we talked about this a little bit, but I, I really I really do think we need to look at existing facilities, and that, that was one thing that didn't come out of that that I appreciate you guys looking at. One thing that, and you kind of reiterated on, on it, but the facility here in Topeka is very underutilized. We have, because of the reform, we have very few kids that are in this facility, and so we've got a facility that really could probably be repurposed if we were able to spread spread them out. So I appreciate you putting this in and, and uh, look forward to seeing what they have to say. Representative Wolfmore. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your report mm -hmm. um, and all your work on this. Um, I, I have a question, and if it's, you know, you can't answer it, that's, I understand. So I remember several years ago, I don't remember what committee I was in, and one of the issues that they were dealing with, particularly at Larnard, and I'm trying to find out if this has anything to do with the geriatric center at Winfield. So they had people who had served their, there were, um, that served their time, and but needed to go into a long-term care facility for care they couldn't go back out into the community. And they were having all kinds of issues, as you might imagine, with long-term care facilities accepting them because of the other residents there not wanting to be with someone who was a sexual predator or whatever. Anything come up on that, or has that been still a problem, or? We didn't have any conversations about that at all. Um, and I don't know whether this can be used for that okay. or not, but um, I, I know that's the purpose of this, is we have some people that are need special care because of the age, and they're not getting out of prison, and, and that's the need for that. But we can try to find out something on that. You know what? That, I'll kind of investigate a little further okay. and see what I can find out. You don't need to go to the trouble, but thank you very much, uh -huh. Mr. Chairman. Representative Helgerson. Let me dovetail on that right away. Um, now Senator Clays and I raised those questions, and we had discussions in the last couple of years in here with, with the current chairman that we do have an aging population and that a nursing home is an ideal, and a nursing home at Winfield was talked about, that that might be an I don't think anything's ever come from it, but it would be more advantageous to the state and more humane for those individuals that are in the prison system. Um, but this is the same time, this gets to my question, uh, about the new prison that we built. And I still, even after last year, when I raised questions, I still have never found out if, if we made money, lost money, were lied to, by the department at that time, and it clouds all my thinking about any expansion or any construction at the department. And I understand we've gone through a number of other people, I think, what, two secretaries since then, or th three? Uh, at least two. At least two. But any time you have the chairman of the subcommittee lied to, and another, and the whole committee lied to, and I was on the House floor about it, I would like some answers. And did you have any other additional information about staffing or costs, uh, whether or not? We specifically asked, um, if you'll remember, um, the, the, the initial proposal had one level of staffing and, and the reduced staffing was supposed to pay for the cost of the construction. You know, right there at the very end, when they actually got ready to uh, utilize the space, they said that uh, the staffing savings that were originally talked about weren't going to be there. When we talked to uh, the agency in the hearing, I brought up that question, and they said that, um, yeah, those, those originally proposed staffing levels weren't going to be able to be met and keep the staff safe. And the 
and the inmate safe. Well, I would just uh, kind of you know discuss that question further. During the interim, we did have that brought up at the Joint Legislative Budget um, Committee meeting, and there was a cost savings uh, in regards to the new facility at Lansing. Not as much as it was anticipated, but there was a cost savings. I don't know if Representative Hoffman agrees with that, but uh, or has any further comments. But um, it just wasn't as much as as we anticipated when that was approved to go ahead and move forward with that new facility at Lansing. Mr. Helgerson. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, I appreciate, and that's what I've been told for the last several years, there was a cost savings, but it wasn't as much. Well, many of us uh, clearly stated on the House floor that this was the savings and it would pay for it over this. I still have not seen a written document from the department or the subsequent departments saying this is what it cost to build the facility, this is what the savings were in the first year, second year, third year, or, you know, and we go through the gyrations between corrections, uh, what Winfield's doing in other facilities, we don't keep track of the dollars. It goes back to your point about the construction and how we're spending money on the buildings. I would love to have a clear picture of our costs on the construction and how people are shifted from different agencies or the buildings are shifted for different agencies and whether or not it makes sense uh, short term and long term. And I appreciate you're asking the question, but I just have real frustrations because we talk about hundreds of millions of dollars uh, and that's what we base our decisions on. And, and I'll try to, to refer to the documents that were received in the Joint Legislative Budget Committee and have those distributed out to all the committee members. Um, in regards to the latter part of your question, I don't know if that will answer that, um, but uh, I'll, I'll go back to the testimony that we received in the Joint Legislative Budget Committee and then have that passed out. Representative Humphreys. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going just a little different direction, but I have a question. I, I didn't realize it looks like you did 20 different units. Thank you for all your work on that. But my question is, um, do, is there a document, or I think we could figure it out, but I'm just curious if you all found out, basically the cost per inmate at each of this, uh, I mean, there's seven regular correctional facilities, one mental health and one juvenile, but those seven is, do we know like what is the cost per inmate? Does it vary much or is it pretty consistent? You know, who's doing a good job with that and who's not? And I just, I would be curious on that information. I, I think one of the things we have to be real careful on when we try to come up with cost per inmate mm -hmm. based upon institution, like for instance, maximum security, deal is going to be much different than a minimum yeah. security and then the age of the the facility is going to directly impact those costs but if you wanted to do and we can have uh staff do it also but well and and honestly capacity with what happened on COVID is going to drastically change that cost but it like for instance let's go to hutchison correctional facility on uh page uh, 402, um, does it have, Merle, does it have the number of inmates in Hutchison? Uh, it provides the capacity on page 402, but it does not tell you the exact amount that's there. Anyway, we can get someone to run those up by institution. I don't think that would be very hard to look at the budgeted amount and then divide it by the number of inmates I and come up with that number. I think that would be interesting, and even the age of the facility, I mean, that instructs us on different aspects and I think I think that would be helpful so thank you so also in the uh, in the overview it, it does talk mm -hmm. about that like for Hutchison it started in 1885 um, but uh, talks about new construction in 1972 so we may be able to come up with something about how many um, inmates or in each aged facility. I know one of the problems that the agency talked about, and I didn't want to get this study too broad, but they almost need to do a facility study system-wide because they talked about they've kind of got a little bit of a problem where they've got some very, uh, well, they got some facilities they're not using, 
and they still have to maintain, like in Larnard, we still have the, or excuse me, Lansing. I've got this little problem here. When I say Larnard, Larnard I mean Lansing. When I say Lansing, I mean <laughs> Larnard. Um, and I know that's really confusing, you know, that kind of keeps you guys looking. Um, but, but in Lansing, they've got the original prison there, which is somewhat historic. You speak in the mic for everybody else. In, in Lansing, they've got this, the original prison, and it's still there, and there's some level of maintenance that still has to happen on it, and it's, you know, functionally obsolete. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Chair, if I may, um, so, and kind of what made me think about it was, and you mentioned Hutchinson. I know they have quite a, a, a good partnership, a, a public-private partnership with an industry right there in the prison, and those workers are paying back part of their uh, cost of being there, plus they're making a, a working wage, a regular uh, wage. And so I was just curious if, you know, how, how like Hutchinson would compare with the others. So, and, and it, all of them actually. So I would appreciate that. And I'm commending Hutchinson for what they're doing, by the way. And, and Representative, to get a little better idea on the uh, Kansas Correctional Industries, which I think is where those programs happen through. You, Page 394 might give some more detail on that also. Well, I know there, there was some discussion, and I can't remember what year it was, um, but in regards to workers at the Ellsworth, Ellsworth Correctional Facility, uh, where they um, constructed manufactured homes, uh, Representative Johnson and Ken Cannon and I, along with Governor Brownback, was at that meeting, and they had expressed concern because we had passed a bill that um, basically eliminated that for the workers there uh, because private industry had come in and said that it was not fair that we were having the correctional um, inmates uh, constructing those homes at a lesser uh, cost than what the private industry was able to make those. And we passed that bill, and the three of us had a conversation with Governor Brownback after that, and, and even the governor had said, we need to correct this. Um, but nothing has been done. Um, and so that's still the situation in Ellsworth. And I believe that was 2014. Yeah. Representative Cannon, did you have a comment? Just adding that, that the complaint w was brought to us because Ellsworth is having a housing shortage. So th that was an issue that actually was kind of perpetuated by the legislature and the, the administration in the correctional system. Representative Humphreys. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And because in Hutchinson, that's, they're, not, they're paying the regular wage they would be getting outside the prison inside. And it's, it's seat king. I mean, it's a, interesting. They're making, I think, electronic like components that. for some different things. So anyway, I just... Let me just... I'm assuming that took care of the issue right. at that facility, and I would hope that we could maybe replicate that other places as well also. All the other costs, Thank you. I think, in there. Right. You're welcome. And, and Representative, we'll forward this uh, spreadsheet to you, but for instance, uh, staff just gave me a um, spreadsheet like uh, ECF, that would be El Dorado Correctional Facility. Um, the average cost per inmate is 28774 by the time you get every every foreseeable cost in there. And, you know, also, I mean, one of the things that really affects things is different inmates need different programming. So this is very much an average cost. Um, but the, uh, that's a relatively low one. The highest one is 31267 at Topeka Correctional Facility. Um, but anyway, they're running everywhere from 28,774 up to about 31, or 32,076 is the highest. We'll forward this to you at a... Thank you. Corner. Appreciate that. Yeah. Representative Carlin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, on this um, 42 million in the juvenile um, evidence-based programs, um, Representative Hoffman and I both serve on that subcommittee, and we've been hearing this since October. Um, but um, I've got a chart here of the actual expenditures in that agency, and uh, the fund has really outgrown the services that we're providing in there. 
Um, so it seems to me a good use of money that for this at this time we can use for other uh, critical needs in our budget. And I'm concerned about taking it um, out of the fund because I know we need to take care of our juveniles. But at this time, there is no concrete plan. There are no expenditures planned. Uh, there is a study proposed. Um, and I, I heard you describe it. I'm not sure I understood how much the study's going to cost or the breadth of it. I do think the study would surely account for need for the services that representative uh, chair of that committee is pushing to have um, use, utilize this money, which is to build three or more facilities, which you said. Um, uh, representative, uh, that wouldn't be funded from these funds. That would come from another funding source, well, that study. But, but just- The study isn't what I mean. I'm, okay, I'm sorry. But there would be a study. Yes. And the study would, would determine need my understanding is it wouldn't be tied directly to these funds. That's, uh, not, the 42 I, I, that's not my question. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm not saying it very well. You said the, the study would be for a cost estimate to, prov to do three or more juvenile facilities using existing facilities where possible, so on. Right. I don't know what the need is for the facilities. Uh, you talked about the two in the Kansas City and Wichita area and about keeping the uh, juveniles close to home. And I've worked with this many years ago when we were separating from the adult prisons, prisoners, and I understand what we're trying to accomplish, and I support it. But at this time, we're spending around eight or 9,000, well, million, I guess, a year in the juvenile programs, and that's what this, I do have a chart of it. I don't know how to send it to anybody off of this website. But it is here, and, and this fund, in 17, we didn't put any reappropriation into it, but we did start putting SGF into it. We're putting in $8 million a year, and we've got $42 million, and we're not spending it for programs. So I think that is why it was um, noticed by the governor for an allotment that we can use for existing critical needs somewhere else in our budget while we plan for the facilities for our juveniles that will be um, addressed in the study that you're recommending. So we don't have a plan yet, and yet we've got $42 million that would leave us a balance of $14 million in that account to more than cover the needs of the juveniles that are in care right now. So I, I will oppose this, uh, this uh, change in your budget. Um, and I would ask the committee to give that serious consideration. We're in a really unusual year, and the next year or two are going to be really tight, and we need to use the, our funds instead of leaving them lay there while we do a study and figure out where we could put a facility and whether it's going to be an existing facility or a new one. We don't know. So I, I've been listening and attending meetings about this, I just don't feel we're ready to spend that money, and so I think there are other places that it should be used, and that would be my concern. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chairman Francis, did you want to have uh, comments? Well, one, I, I just in response to some of those concerns, this funding goes for the uh, juveniles that were formerly incarcerated <laughs> until juvenile justice reform in 2016. It doesn't go necessarily to the ones that are currently incarcerated. That's not the focus on it. So the, the fund didn't really start until 2017. Um, to give you some ideas of uh, um, the funding that has went into it, uh, I believe in 2017, 8 million went into it. Um, well, a total of 10 million. Um, and then this fund reappropriates. So uh, in 2018, it grew to 22 million. In 2019, it grew to 33 million. And then um, in 2020, it grew to 51 million, which is all true. But this year, the appropriation into that account dropped to $54,000. And I think that's some of the concern right here. The plan always was that this programming would be developed as they had time to make sure that it was evidence-based programming. 
Um, expenditures out of this fund in 2020 were 9.6 million, uh, 3.5 million. Excuse me. Expenditures in 2020 were 9.6 million transfers out, uh, 3.5 million in 2019. So just as we're starting to hit our stride on this fund, it's being swept. And, um, and, and also, just as we're hitting our stride, the uh, revenues into this fund have dropped dramatically. Again, last year the transfers in were 9138000 This year the transfers in are $54,509. May I? You may. Uh, according to this chart, uh, the SGF appropriation from state general fund in 2020 was $12,485,000. And um, the uh, reappropriation was $30 million, which means, what does reappropriation mean? I think that means we didn't spend it. We're not utilizing it, and I want to utilize it. I don't have a problem with that, but we're not. Where there is nothing the need is not that great or it's not being utilized at this time. And we've discussed why it wasn't utilized and I'm comfortable with the answers that I got. I can't re re tell you what they are right now. But the 54,000 that you see right now uh, in 2021, is that the balance um, in the account after the sweep, which um, we're halfway through the year? The transfer in of 54,500. 509 is what the agency estimates are the savings from the juvenile justice reform in 2016. Um, they estimated that amount to be 9 million in 2020. Uh, there was a clerical error on that number because of the ERO and, and COVID and things like that. And that's part of the reason why we're down to the 54,000. Uh, in 2019, the savings were estimated to be 3.9 million. But the SGS, SGF appropriation for 21 was $14 million. That's and what we've they never have. spent that much money in a year. So I think, I mean, we're looking at a 11, what are we looking at, a balance after, after the um, use of the money in other ways, which I'm not sure what they are. But we would still have a balance in the fund to take care of this, uh, the juveniles for this year. And we're still reappropriating money from the SGF of $14 million for 2022. We're not going to not care for these juveniles. And while we're doing a plan, and it can be as grandiose as we want, I don't have a problem with what we do, but we, we need it in other areas, Mr. Chair. And I would recommend that we... Um, not take, not re, um, reallocate that. Is that a motion? Yes, it is. All right, committee, you've heard the motion. Is there a second? Second by Representative Helgerson. Discussion on the motion? Uh, again, Chairman Francis. Again, Mr. Chairman, uh, we're really concerned about the decrease of funding that's going to go for this. You know, it's like many of the things we do up here. We set aside money to take care of things in the future. This is a promise we made in 2016. Uh, I, I think it's important that we maintain that promise uh, so that there's adequate funding there for uh, uh, prevention and juvenile programs. Representative Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman, uh, I believe this was swept, what, two years ago, three years ago, and we, we ended up having to put money back into it. Was I it last year or the year before? I don't remember. I'm sorry. Well, it was, it was taken out of, out of uh, I think it was put in DCF. I, I think that's what it was. We, it was. Part of it was moved. Not all of it. Part of the ERO, possibly, yeah. Yeah, and then we, we ended up, that was part of the budget maybe two years ago. Right. So, I mean, yeah. Yeah. I just would reiterate, I, you know, the, the, the savings are, we're, we are going to see less and less savings as, there, as the years go by. And, and I, I think that once these programs get up, this money is going to be used. And I, I'd hate for us to uh, take it before we had the chance to actually use it for the purpose that it was designed for. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Kikinen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Could, 
Could, I have some clarification about what the motion, what her motion is, does. Representative McCarlin, can you restate your motion? I would, Mr. Chair. I do not have a copy of the budget report in front of me, but whatever item that is, I would remove that from the uh, a committee's report. Would be budget committee recommendation number one. Thank you. Yes. Representative Helgerson. Well, I second it, but I'm still confused about the 42 million and the 14 million that I'm hearing about, and really how much is in the account. And well, let me bring in my computer. and if someone could walk through this a little bit for me, uh, or s staff, or Shannon. Just so I understand, really, how much money is in the account and how much money is going. There's where we are, right there. There's the two, and there's the annual putting in. This is SGF going in. Yeah. Chairman Francis, can you um, try to answer Representative Helgerson's question? Probably need a cheat sheet. There you go. Um, so, to begin, probably the easiest way, fiscal year 2021, this is how we uh, get here. There's an appropriation of 14321500 There's a reappropriation of 42136132 And then the transfer in, which is the thing that's declining extremely fast, is um, the cost savings estimated from the um, YFC and what's the other... Um, Kansas Juvenile Corrections, uh, that's the 54509 So that leaves a balance this year of 56512141 We've got uh, budgeted expenditures of 14321500 and then they want to lapse the 42196 back to the general fund. Now, the 14321500 um, it is, I believe, help me with this staff, is it being reappropriated into uh, 2022? No. Okay. So she's saying she's going to allow expenditures of $14 million yeah. this year. Fourteen million. Okay. So in 2021, the governor has appropriated 14 million, and then she allows expenditures of uh, 14 million, and then reappropriates 14 million in fiscal year 2022. Representative Helgerson, does that answer your question? Roughly. <laughs> and our expenditures in 2020 were at uh, 9.6 million. All right, on the amendment, Representative Kikannon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, okay, I think I've gotten clarification now on, on what the amendment is. And um, I'm going to oppose the amendment. Um, you know, when, when this bill was passed um, a couple of years ago, the, the onus was put back on the communities to take care of these juveniles. And the comment that we're going to always take care of the juveniles is simply not true. They're not being taken care of. They're in these communities with no services. And um, as, I, as I'm out in my district, there's so much frustration. And they're saying, please repeal that. And I that's not going to get repealed. We're not putting these kids back into prisons. They said, then give us what, then we've got to be, have some funding to, to, um, have some programs. Judges are frustrated because they don't have anything that they can, any place that they can refer the juveniles to. This is exactly what we need. This is exactly what we need to, to um, look at getting these evidence-based programs put in, put out into um, our, our communities. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Chairman Francis. And, and to concur with uh, the representative, uh, in our fiscal year 2022 recommendation to the committee, we have started to push out 
ways that the juvenile correction agencies can access more of these funds because we have waited on the stakeholders to uh, make these funds available and it has been slow and, and we're trying to pick up the, the pace. One of the things I think was always the concern was give everybody time to develop the programs so that we're just not flooding the system with too much money too quick and, and we're working on that now. Thank you. All right, any further discussion on the amendment? All right, seeing none, Representative Carlin, you may close. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> when I heard this the first time in the first meeting that it came up, <clears throat> I asked why in the world we weren't doing, just as Representative Gunkenna mentioned, why aren't we not putting this money to work for the juveniles? What is going on? I still don't think I have the answer to that, but the appropriation um, this maneuver that we're talking about would still leave, a, uh, if we're spending $9 million a year, it still leaves $5 million that's not spent. And I am looking at this and I'm saying, yes, let's do this, but we have money every year to put into this. And when we have a plan, is the time to put the money in to take care of the plan for the new facilities. I was distraught. When, in 06, when we started, was it 06? No, about oh, probably 12. When we started closing the uh, juvenile facilities, the PRTFs, and putting kids in other facilities instead of in the group homes that needed it. And they kept getting into trouble and then winding up, wind up in the juvenile system. I have not approved of what has been going on. But I, I see the funding is adequate, and I move my motion. All right, committee, you've heard the motion. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. The no's appear to have it. The no's do have it. Motion fails. We're back on the budget for fiscal year 2021. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Chairman Francis, you may move on to fiscal year 2022. Okay, for fiscal year 2022, the agency requested 490 million, including 448 million SGF for the entire uh, system for fiscal year 2022. These expenditures are for, again, uh, Department of Corrections, Correctional Industries, and the Correctional Facilities and the Kansas Juvenile Correctional Complex. This is an all funds increase of 2.1 million and then SGF increase of 12.3 million or 2.8% above the fiscal year 2021 revised estimate. Uh, the request includes 3,333.5 FT positions for the system. That's a decrease of 31 FT below the fiscal year 2021 revised estimate. Again, that's because of the decrease of temporary correctional officer positions at the Larned Correctional Mental Health Facility. Um, the agency requested operating budgets totaling 477.2 million, including 442.8 million for fiscal year 2022. This is an all funds increase of 6.9 million or 1.5% and an SGF increase of 13.4 million or 3% above the 2021 revised estimate. The increase is primarily attributable to the agency's 11 enhancement requests. These enhancements are related to uh, an increase for certain staff salaries and retirement benefits. The governor did not recommend those uh, in her share. Adjustments to the food and medical services for inmates and the shifting of expenditures from Larned State Hospital to the Kansas Department of Corrections Central Office for aspects related to inmates. One of the things that happened at Larned was um, they were uh, the state hospital was supplying uh, meals to the uh, correctional facility there. Um, there was a tremendous cost saving by uh, the Larned Correctional Facility going on the same system that the rest of the, uh, uh, or on the same contract that the rest of the system was on. And it was savings for both, uh, both entities, both the state hospital and uh, uh, the correctional facility. Um, it also budgeted an annual lease payment for the Lansing Correctional Facility for $15 million. 
Uh, the increase is partially offset by decreased salaries and wages uh, due to eliminating 31 temporary corrections at Larnard, um, which were funded by a federal grant. Um, the 2022 request by the agency includes capital improvements for the system of 13 million. This is an all funds decrease of 4.7 million and an SGF decrease of 1.1 million below the fiscal year 2021 revised estimate. Decreases attributed to decreased expenditures for routine repair and rehab at correctional facilities. Uh, the funds for such projects are held at the Department of Corrections Central Office for planning purposes and transferred to facilities in the current year. The agency budgeted 6.1 million SGF in the final year for the two-year capacity expansion projects that included the uh, Substance Abuse Treatment Center at Lansing and the Nursing Care and Substance Abuse Treatment Center at Winfield. The governor recommended 466.6 million, including 408.9 million for the entire system for fiscal year 2022. This is an all funds decrease of 23.8 million and an SGF decrease of 39.9 million below the agency's fiscal year 2022 request. And uh, the governor recommends operating budgets totaling 451.4 million, including 407 million SGF for fiscal year 2022. Um, this is an all funds decrease of 25.8 million or 5.4% and an SGF decrease of 35.8 million below the agency's fiscal year 2022 request. The decrease is attributable to the governor not recommending several of the agency's enhancements requests and adopting a modified reduced resources budget. The expenditures or the recommendation includes shifting 2.1 million SGF from Larnard um, State Hospital to the Department of Corrections Central Office for expenditures related to the housing of inmates with mental health needs and food service operations at uh, the mental health facility. Another part of that, uh, what they're basically doing is kind of straightening out the accounting on um, some of the uh, individuals in the correction system. So at one time, the state hospital um, moved some inmates back into the correction system. And because they moved those there, the correction system put some inmates in county jails. Um, and for that, the state hospital was paying the corrections department, 1.5 million. And they basically just cleaned that up. They're making sure the original appropriation goes into uh, corrections rather than going into the state hospital and then flowing through to corrections. Um, so some of the way the other sources of the decreases are 10.6 million for beds that were uh, contracted uh, in Arizona. Um, a decrease of 10 million SGF for graduated sanction grants awarded to juvenile community corrections agencies. This was offset by an increase of 10 million in expenditures from the juvenile alternatives to detention fund for the same purpose. So it was just a switch from SGF to uh, dedicated fund. A decrease of 4.4 million for inmate food services and health care due to decreased prison populations a decrease of 4.1 million due to the governor not recommending enhancements for the unit team counselor and parole officer pay equity. Uh, I do wanna mention, we've got a little bit of a problem from remember a couple of years ago when we were having some problems and we increased uh, salaries for uh, corrections officers. Um, they're having a little bit of um, a problem with their uh, pay for the unit team counselors and parole officers. Um, they've got that uh, contraction in the pay scales that's creating them some issues. But again, the governor didn't recommend it, recommend it but it's something that we, we're gonna have to address someday. I mean, it's not a problem that's gonna get better in the future. Um, a decrease of 3.4 million SGF due to the governor recommending an alternative financing plan for replacement of the adult and juvenile offender management data systems. Um, they broadened the scope on this. There was a little bit change in the um, uh, timing of the payments on this. Uh, the original estimate by the agency was for 20 million. Uh, they refined that and broadened the scope a little bit. The cost is now 25 million and they changed some of the uh, timing of those payments. Um, 
a decrease of $2 million due to the governor not recommending enhancement requests for safety and security equipment, and a decrease of $947,000 due to the governor adopting reduced resources proposals and increased shrinkage among correctional facilities and reduced central office salaries and wages. Um, Governor recommends $15.2 million, including $1.9 million SGF for capital improvement expenditures through KDOC system. That sounds too much like KDOT, but KDOC system for fiscal year 2022. This is an all funds increase of $1.9 million or 14.6%, and an SGF decrease of $4.2 million or 68.2%. The increase is attributable to the shift of expenditures related to the replacement of adult and juvenile offender management data systems from operating expenditures to capital improvements expenditures. The recommendation also includes a shift of 6.1 million. I referred to this earlier. So, so the second phase of the Lansing and Winfield projects, we're having a shift of 6.1 million from SGF to special revenue funds, which is the state uh, building, yeah, state institutional building fund. Okay, budget committee concurred with the governor's recommendation for fiscal year 2022 uh, with one adjustment. Again, we're trying to get more of these funds out in the communities to help the juveniles. So we appropriated um, the juvenile crime community prevention account of the SGF for fiscal year 2022. We added 1.5 million all from SGF to the new juvenile crime community prevention account and deleted 1.5 million all SGF from the evidence-based juvenile programs account for fiscal year 2022. We added language that funds be made available as grants to communities for evidence-based juvenile crime prevention programs. We also added language providing that of that 1.5 million appropriated to the fund, 500,000 be used solely for a dollar for dollar cash match for funds available or provided by sources other than KDOC, and the budget committee notes that it's intent that reappropriation be permitted for the fund for fiscal year 2023. We had three or four people from across the state testify for the need for additional funds for, for this, and, and this was the approach that we took this year. So with that, I would stand for questions. All right, thank you, Chairman Francis. Uh, questions for Chairman Francis, Representative Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, and this, this may not be for, um, for you, um, Chairman, but the, I'm hearing quite a few times where we're taking money out of the um, the building fund or the um, state. Uh, I can't remember now what you, institutional fund. Yeah. Do we have an idea of how much money is in that? I, it. I mean, it seems like this year there's there's quite a few times I'm hearing that, and I. Yeah, I don't know. So. And that, and that could be something you could you can get to us later. I, I don't necessarily, I'd just be kind of interested in knowing what we have in that. Yeah. Information out for you. Okay. We, yeah, we didn't explore that. And is that institutional building fund, is that funded by the money that's received from the lottery? I think that's the mill, isn't it? The 1.5 mill on our pro oh, yeah. yeah. Representative Carpenter, do you have a? Just a clarification, that's a half a percent on real property. Okay. All right. Thank you. That every year the, the appropriation is that. So I don't remember the balances. I pulled the fund earlier because we did have some money out of the state hospitals and stuff. So, But I've forgotten what it was. But it's a half percent of real property. All right. Thank you. Any further questions for Chairman Francis in regards to fiscal year 2022? Chairman Francis. Um, at the end of fiscal year 2022, it's estimated the state uh, institution building fund to have 11.9 million in it. So that would be after this. That's, that's as far as the governor's recommendation? Any that's the governor's recommendation, yeah. So it wouldn't reflect anything mm -hmm. that the legislature right. did in addition to that. But it would, it would, it would reflect what she has in yeah. all the times we're hearing. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, I was busy looking and talking and not right, listening. That's all right. Um, any further questions? All right. Seeing none, Chairman Francis. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move the committee recommendations for the Department of Corrections budget for fiscal years 2021 and 2022 be approved. All right, committee, you've heard the motion. Is there a second? Second by Representative Helgerson. All those in favor, say aye. aye. Opposed? All right, motion passes. Thank you, Chairman Francis. Um, committee, we do have a little bit of time, and I uh, want to go ahead and start working um, House Bill 2101. And that, if you recall, was uh, the extending of transfers from the Expanded Lottery Act Revenues Fund to the University Engineering Initiative. Um, so we're going to start working on House Bill 2101. Representative Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move that we pass out uh, House Bill 2101 favorable, and I do have an amendment. All right, committee, you've heard the motion. Is there a second? Second by Representative Carlin. Discussion on the motion. Representative Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, David, if you could send that, or actually, want to, if you could send it, but then also put it up on the screen. What the amendment does would put in some um, language that would basically uh, give us some. Oh. It would it would uh, provide some reporting to us uh, from the uh, different uh, universities and the board of regents on on what, they, what they've uh, seen over the last three years, um, who stayed in the state, how many graduates, things like that. David, would you like to explain it a little bit better? Yeah, David, could you elaborate on the amendment? <clears throat> uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, can you hear me? Yes, so we can hear you. Okay, hey, great. Yes, this is a, it looks kind of busier than really what it is because we're bringing in an additional section from the University of Engineering Initiative Act. Um, but the substantive amendment, as you can see here on page two, is, is this new language and a new subsection D, the underlying portion. So this would require, you know, on or before the first day of the 22 regular session and then annually thereafter, the, you know, the educational institutions, the KU, K-State, Wichita State, the Board of Regents, and the Secretary of Commerce would report to uh, House Appropriations and Senate, Way Senate Ways and Means on how many graduate engineering graduates remain in the state over the previous three years, three year look back. And then each of those parties would provide detail concerning their efforts to increase retention and, uh, and opportunities for uh, engineering graduates within Kansas. Then everything else is just kind of conforming the title and repealer um, to reflect this new section that's being brought in. All right, committee, you've heard the motion to amend, a second by Representative Tarwater. Discussion on the amendment. Representative Wolfmore. I'm sorry, I stepped out for uh, one moment um, and I missed the amendment. Representative Hoffman. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It would. It would have the Board of Regents and our, the three uh, universities that are getting the, uh, the, the appropriations to report to the Appropriations Committee and the uh, Ways and Means Committee every year on the, the number of graduates that are st still in the state after three years that are working in the state and also um, what they're doing to increase retention of graduates and opportunities for graduations in the state. Okay, thank you. So that's just a reporting, not a requirement of any time? Yeah, no requirement, just, just a reporting. That, that sounds reasonable. Thank you very much. Any further questions or discussion on the amendment? Chair? Sure. None? Yes? John Alpha, I do, I do have a question. Um, so it would, be the, it would be interesting to also know how many of them were attending the college from out of state because after graduation and completion, how many of them would probably end up going back home uh, versus being non, being Kansas residents? Representative Hoffman, do you have a response to that? Yeah, I, I wouldn't disagree. I'm not sure. Let me look here. My only point is, I, I want to. I, I think it'd be more data driven if that was in there, uh, because of uh, it could be confusing if you've seen that you had, you know, a thousand students that graduated and six hundred of them left, 
but knowing that they originally weren't from here and utilize the university because of the say K State because they're great engineering school, uh, but had no intentions of staying anyway because not being from here. Right, um, David. Do you have an idea of maybe a change in the where that could where that could be added? I I, I think that's probably a, a good idea. David. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I mean, I think we could include some, some language within within this subsection to list, um, you know, the amount of the amount of uh, with each institution, the amount of uh, out of state students versus in state. And then, I mean, I think that's up to up to you how you wanted to say it exactly, but we can work that in. I'd be good with that if somebody could find the verbiage where it would fit. And I'm assuming, Representative Hoffman, that you're uh, you're fine with the accommodation of changing the language. And is that all right with the second? I am. All right. Any further discussion on the amendment, Representative Parker? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I I'm not sure that I'm opposed to it. I think just the just uh, reporting it is fine. But I guess my only concern with all of this is. I don't want to disincentivize our universities from attracting top talent from all over the country. And maybe Representative Apple's concerns get to that a little bit. I mean, I think it's a great thing if KU can pull in the top engineering students from around the country. Um, and they may be less likely to settle in Kansas if they came from somewhere else. But I, again, not necessarily opposed to this. I just want to make sure that we're mindful of that. Or that's not necessarily a bad thing for our state if our universities are attracting the top talent. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any further discussion? Representative Tarwater. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I like the um, I like the amendment and I like the change to the amendment because these are Kansas taxpayer dollars and the students that go through our K-12 system and then end up in college, we're spending literally hundreds of thousands of dollars per person. So it's important to know where they're going and why they're leaving. And if, if they're coming from another state and then going home, how does, I mean, <clears throat> how does that make sense to fund it with Kansas taxpayer dollars if, if we know they're gonna go back home anyway? So that's, I th I'm, I'm happy with it all. I think that in the future, I'll push for um, parceling the money out based on retention. Wichita State keeps about 70-some percent as their students. The average is the people that leave after graduation from our universities is 62 percent. And so if Wichita State's in the, in, in the 70 or is in the low 20s, what does that what does that say for the other universities? And so, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing these numbers and maybe maybe this money gets divided up based on who retains the students in Kansas. Thanks. Any further discussion? Representative Wolfmore. So, I know that the engineering program already has a memorandum of understanding with commerce. So how does this change that or what? I, I'm, not clear on all of this anymore. I, I, guess. I don't think it really does, but I'll have Representative Hoffman answer that. Right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't believe it would change any of that. It would just simply the the appropriate. I mean, the uh, Commerce Committee would actually be the ones that would be reporting it to us. So the the age the uh, the universities. If I'm reading, if I'm pretty sure that's correct. Uh, David can correct me if I'm wrong, but the universities would would give this information to the to commerce or commerce would ask for it and then they would be the ones reporting it to us and it kind of goes back to you know all these all of our incentive programs we're trying to get some sort of reporting some sort of a look back and so that just kind of puts that in this represent ballard thank you mr mr chair I remember when they were talking about doing this program in the first place and what we're excited about it, it was because the state of Kansas needed more engineers in the state. And that's what we were talking about. And, and then I think it was part of that combination. I hope I remember aviation got money to, I mean, it was, it was a, a combination of things that we wanted, but it was to increase 
the population of engineers in the state. I think we still can attract um, the outstanding student. And I can think of two, and that's very small, but uh, as an example, I'm going to use it. I can think of two that came from out of state, and both of them decided to stay uh, in, in Kansas, <laughs> and mainly because they met uh, you know, they met two women from Kansas, and that's how they ended up staying. So they don't all leave, but I think we still should focus on how many are we really keeping in the state if we look at the original intent of what we were voting for. And I met this summer with a person talking about that. Um, and I don't think it's too much to expect that you will give a report of how it's going, because we ask that of um, a lot of our programs to give us an update, how it's working, and everything else. And I don't think it's going to dampen the students that want to come. But we still have to focus on we want to make sure we retain enough in the state, because that's what the need was presented to us in the beginning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Wolfmore. Well, as I think about it, I think we actually want students from out of state because we don't get students out of state, from out of state, from Chicago, wherever. We have no shot of keeping them here in Kansas. So um, I think it's important that we attract from other states. And then hopefully, hopefully, um, like Representative Ballard said, we will have a shot of getting them attracted to an industry here and staying in our state. I think that broadens our pool. Thank you. Any further discussion? All right, seeing none, Representative Hoffman, you may move your motion. Thank you, yeah, and I don't think this hinders the ability for them to attract out of state, you know, uh, students, but I also think it's important to for us to know how this program is, is uh, going. So with that, I move my amendment. All right, committee, you've heard the motion. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Any further discussion on House Bill 2101? Seeing none, Chairman Hoffman, you may, Vice Chairman Hoffman, you may move your motion. I missed something? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I close. All right, committee, you've heard uh, the motion. All those in favor of passing House Bill 2101 as amended out of committee, please say aye. Opposed? All right, motion passes. Um, committee, you should have received a, um, a report from the Office of the Medicaid Inspector General uh, that was received in my office yesterday, and so you should receive that. That's required to be uh, submitted to the Appropriations Committee. And then uh, tomorrow, uh, we will be having uh, a committee tomorrow, and that will be actually be Chairman Sutton, who will be here with the General Government Budget Committee. So until tomorrow at 9 a.m. Uh, yes, David. Uh, did we get a second on that motion to pass out as amended? Actually, we did not, but uh, seconded by Representative Carlin. All right. Okay, anything else? We are adjourned until 9 a.m. tomorrow.